Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Dairy Raid. And plan was to go outside and do a little walk and talk this morning and talk about everything that happened over the weekend with Wisconsin football. And we got a lot added on to the end of the day yesterday. But as we can see by the weather outside, it has been pissing rain all morning. And we're going to change things up a little bit. And instead of a walk and talk, we're going to go have a seat on the couch, pour a cup of coffee, and we're going to talk about the firing of Phil Longo. So, here we go. On this show, we talk about coffee, New York, daughters, dogs, you know, no big whoop, just coffee talk. <laughs> All right, so here we are. We're over at the couch, coffee in hand. So let's talk about this. So, I, for one, was beyond ecstatic when Phil Longo was hired. Um, it's no secret that I have been a follower of his offense, his scheme, and his teachings for a while. I thought what his take on the air raid offense was very relatable and very translatable to what I do. And I, in my heart, and I still believe that it was a great fit for the direction that Wisconsin football wanted to go. Now, what you don't realize or you don't think about a lot when you get these kind of situations is you see the scheme, you see the coach, but you don't really think about how the scheme and the coach fits within a culture of a program. And that culture starts at the top with Luke Fickle. Now, I give Luke Fickle a ton of credit for really thinking outside of the box with this hire. Um, usually defensive coaches, when they hire an offensive coordinator, they want somebody that they can give the offense to and not have to worry about. It's about comfort. It's about reliability. And so that's why I thought this was going to be Gino Gadouli right away. It was the logical choice. It was his incumbent OC at Cincinnati. He had some success. Not quite the same level as Mike Denbrook, but, you know, he took what Denbrook built at Cincinnati and he, he kept it going. Um, it, it was a logical choice. And so when he hired Phil Longo, I was shocked. But really excited because it made me think that Luke Fickle is a coach who thinks outside of the box and a coach who understands that football needs to go forward. I still believe that. But what I don't think he realized was he is a different type of coach when it comes to the relationship between him and his O.C., He's very hands-on, obviously, now. And I think he misread Phil Longo when it came time to hiring him. I think he thought he had an OC that would come in and Lou Fickle would present him with, here you go, this is what we want to do. This is what we're going to do on offense. Um, maybe... Phil Longo took that and was like, yeah, you know, I've been coaching for a very strong head coach these last few years who let me do my thing. Maybe it's time for me to, to sit back and bring in input from the outside and have my head coach be a part of the system that I'm building. 
it just didn't work. And you could see it kind of from the beginning because it always seemed like every time something happened at the offense, Luke Fickle would go to the press and say, basically, I don't know what's happening, but we're going to look into it. Um, that, to me, never gave the confidence that he trusted what Phil Longo was doing. And he kept telling us what he wanted the offense to be. And Phil Longo played the good soldier and would answer, you know, we believe in Fick. Fick is establishing a culture. Fick is establishing a, a system. And the offense is part of it. He said all the right things about not forgetting about Wisconsin history and building an offense around that. And, but at the end of the day, it, it came down to, I think, kind of two things for me and why the offense really never took off. One, like I said, Luke Fickle didn't trust Phil Longo enough to just give him the keys and let him build the offense. I think he did at times this year. And I think we saw that in the three-game stretch with Northwestern, Rutgers, and Purdue. And we saw flashes. But every time we saw a flash and things started to taper a little bit after that flash, it went straight downhill because I think that's when Luke, Fingle, Luke Fickle came in and said, no, let's go back to this. And then two, a lot of coaches who coach within a system a well-established system or philosophy were arrogant and in a good way and in a bad way. Luke, I think Phil Longo had in his head that his system was just like Nova Kane. Give it time always works. And I don't think he realized how big of a task it was to move from the archaic offense that Wisconsin ran before, and I will say archaic. You know, people are going to get mad at me in the comments for saying this, but it was Wisconsin and Iowa there at the end. Sorry, it was. To a more modern offense. And Phil Longo is not Mike Leach. He's not Hell Mummy. He's not Dana Holgerson. Phil Longo runs an air raid adjacent offense. But... To take the step from the run, run, pass, run, run, pass, run, run, pass. Everyone in the in the planet knows what Paul Kristoff is going to run on this play. To let's try to establish a new system. It was too much. And... I think if you're going to make the change to modern football, and it, it needs to happen... And it happened, and it's not, we're not going back. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, you have to have a coach who is willing to take baby steps. And I think Phil Longo did because there's so much that he didn't do. But I think that it came to a point where he dumbed it down so much that it rendered the offense ineffective. It doesn't help. With the issues with quarterback. And again, we're going to talk about... This is going to be a long video. Just giving you, giving you the heads up there. So, at the end of the day, I think we had two strong-minded coaches. And it was best for them to part ways. I think Phil Longo is going to get a job in the SEC. Or the Pac-12. Or something. Something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets the Utah job. And he's going to go back to his winning ways. It just wasn't the right fit. And that's it. So where do we go from here? Now, going into this, I I, uh, I asked you guys on Twitter for some questions. And normally I get two or three. I got 13 of them here. 
Now, a lot of them are kind of the same thing. So we're going to go through some of these and kind of build into uh, some of the, uh, the questions you guys have here, and we'll kind of build from the rest of there. All right. So the number one question I got is, we're going to save it to the end. The number two question I got is, what offensive scheme do, do I think that Wisconsin should follow going forward? Should we be thinking about scheme, or should we be focusing on just finding the best available OC? Well, let's talk about that. I've been saying it from the beginning that if Paul Chris would have hired the right offensive coordinator going into the 2022 season and let him do his job, okay? Because Paul Chris was the same way. He was a meddler as well. He never let his OC. I mean, we never knew who was calling plays when Paul Chris was in there. Most of the time it was him, even if he had an OC, even though if he said he was giving up play calling. Um, I said back then if he hired the right offensive coordinator, he'd still have a job. And I think if Luke Fickle hires a coach along the lines of which I was thinking about, about back in 2022, we could find the balance between Wisconsin values, modern football, and an offense that's progressive enough that we are going to be able to attract recruits because that is the key. Um, so for me, it falls within that, um, umbrella of the power spread. We're not going to go back to lining up an I formation and running ISO all day. Nobody does that anymore. Okay. Sorry. But you can run power football. And you can run an effective rushing attack. In fact, I'm going to look just, I got my laptop here in front of me. And I, I want to go through the top 10 or so rushing offenses in college football. And we're going to talk about what kind of schemes they run. And we're going to go from there. All right, so. Army, okay, Flexbone, they run a lot of spread. Flexbone is a spread. Flexbone is the zone read under center. UCF, spread. Boise State, power spread. Jacksonville State, power spread. Liberty, spread. UNLV, wing T out of uh, shotgun, New Mexico, similar, Navy, flex bone, power spread from the gun, Tulane, spread, Tennessee, air raid, Northern Illinois, power spread, Notre Dame, power spread slash Pro spread. Okay. That's top. Uh, I think that's top 11. So. We fit in that power spread type category. The kind of same thing that the, the, you know, that the Midwestern good running teams do. Okay. Notice none of these teams are coming out and running I formation every play. Um, so what is power spread? You're going to see. For the run game, you're going to see a lot of similar things. Multiple tight end sets. H back, H three, uh, 11 personnel, H back as your base set. But using multiple tight ends. Okay, Running power scheme, running play action, running RPO off a of power scheme. Less zone than you're seeing with you know, a lot of like air raid teams, for example, uh, I think we're going to see less inside zone. I think we'll still see outside zone because I think we'll probably be basing for running a power spread, probably basing more out of pistol, which I'm not a huge fan of. I have a lot of things where I don't like pistol, uh, but whatever, 
you know, it's a Division One program. They'll get the kids to do what they want. It's fine. Um, you're going to see formation to set the width of the defense with the idea of running things more vertically. So up and downhill with the running game and more vertical with the passing game and building those two off of each other. I think for me, and that's coming back to 2022, that would have been the best marriage of Wisconsin values in modern football is to go to the power spread. Um, it has been a popular umbrella system of college football for years. A lot of the big name offensive coordinators and offenses is fit under that category. Chip Kelly, Urban Meyer towards the end, uh, you name it. So that, for me, that's where I would want to go. They have to find, if it comes to finding the right OC, that that's key. Because Luke Fickle knows this is his last offensive coordinator hire. He's got to hit a home run with this one or he's done. He knows that. Everybody knows that. So finding the right guy that fits the values of what Luke Fickle wants and is going to get kids in is going to be vitally important. All right. So that leads to the next question. And is, who, or what, what is with the timing of this firing? Why do it now with only two games left? Well, it's because they have got to get this nailed down by, by the end of the season. And they're clever about this because Wisconsin is a public university. By the rules that the that the university has, Luke Fickle has to they have to post this job publicly for two weeks before they can fill it. So what they're going to do is they're going to post it ASAP, and they are already going to have their fingers out there or you know out there calling people. So the second the season's over and you're in that week or so or that time period between. The end of the regular season and the beginning uh, or the end of the recruiting cycle, the early signing period, and the beginning of the transfer portal window, you already have your OC in place. You can't wait. Uh, some people in my Twitter mention, mentions had, had said, you know, we should wait until the coaching cycle is over and then find some. It's too late by then. You know. We are going to lose kids because we lost Luke Fickle. Like, honestly, I would be shocked if the number one QB going into the bowl game is the freshman from Minnesota, the walk -on. Maybe Cole Crew if he's still healthy. Who knows? He probably hurt himself by now. The quarterbacks are gone. The quarterback recruits are probably gone. So the Badgers have to start over, and it's better to start over now when you know what's going to happen than to wait and pick up the leftovers when you get to the end of the coaching cycle. And uh, if we're all noticing here, as soon as I sat down and talked about how much it was raining outside, of course, it's bright and sunny. Go figure, right? So the timing is fine. I, I think it, it just came to a head. I have a feeling, and I'm going to talk about it here when I get into uh, one of these last points. I have a feeling of why this happened now. But I'm okay with the timing because it's necessary if you don't want to get behind when it comes to the next or the end of the season cycle going into recruiting into the transfer portal. 
All right, so that leads to the, the inevitable question. And that question is, who's it going to be? Now, I pontificated who it should be. And I started with this as a joke, but I'm kind of serious with some of this. Number one, someone the fans are going to hate because they're not from Wisconsin. Number two, some retread who used a fullback back in 2008. Number three, not Sean Lewis. And number four, Gino Gadouli. Your candidate is right there amongst those, those four things. Uh, I also threw out some names of some people that I would be interested in. And it we're hitting we're kind of hitting the the, the gamut of, of type of coaches here, you know guys like Ben Arbuckle from Washington State, who is a young up and coming air raid uh, wonder kid. You know he's he's going to be the type of guy who's going to get a head coaching job at a uh, a Sun Belt team here in a couple of years, and he'll be he's going to start moving his way up the ladder. Uh, well respected young guy, twenty nine years old, something like that. Um, from the Mike Leach tree, obviously. You know if we, if Fickle want to keep going and you know even farther down the air raid uh, rabbit hole, he'd be the choice. Um, then you've got the Ohio State connections. You know, people have talked about Brian Hartline since uh, Chip Kelly came in. He kind of got demoted. Um, you know, he's a wide receiver coach, so you'd have to do some finagling within the staff. You know, maybe move Kenny Guyton to quarterback coach, which he could certainly do as a former quarterback in a power spread system, by the way, um, with air raid experience, uh, by the way. Or you look at somebody like Corey Dennis, who was the quarterback coach at Ohio State before Chip Kelly came in. Now he's the I think he's the OC at Tulsa. Uh, another guy I've I've mentioned him a couple years ago about a potential candidate. Another young guy that kind of fits that that vibe you're looking for to help get the uh, the young recruits. Um, you know, talking about guys like if. Mac was willing to open up the wallet and really dig deep. You know, could you spend enough money to get Mike Denbrook from North or from uh, Notre Dame? Could you spend enough money to get Andy Kotelnicki away from Penn State? Kotelnicki spent so much time coaching Wisconsin. Um, played at. River Falls, you know, coach at Whitewater. That would be great. Um, I don't see it happening because I think the out, out the outcry for you know spending that much money from the the old fogey fans, the the no fickles, uh, would probably be too much. And I think Mac is going to be a little bit more conservative when it comes to his hire. Um, I threw out there as, you know, this would be more if they just can't find anybody and the idea of taking Kenny Guyton and A.J. Blazek and doing a passing game, running game coordinator type pairing. Um, I think that would be intriguing. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I think if it happens, that means nobody wants to come to Wisconsin. Um, and, you know, I threw out a couple, you know, really random names. I've got, uh, like, you know, V's offensive coordinator, uh, Navy's current offensive coordinator, you know, some guys like that. There's a lot of candidates out there. It's going to be Gino Gadouli. Uh, unless Notre Dame decides 
that they are going to match and give Gino Gadulli Wisconsin OC money to be the quarterback coach at Notre Dame, I I don't see how it's not going to be him. And I don't think Notre Dame's going to do that because it's Notre Dame. Notre Dame can hire whoever they want to be to be their quarterback coach. It's Notre Dame. And Gino Gadulli makes the most sense. The offense that he ran, picking up after Mike Denbrook left to go to LSU, is power spread enough that I think it fits the personnel who are on the Wisconsin roster. He's shown the ability to coach up quarterbacks above their pay grade and put quarterbacks in the league. Doesn't matter how good they are when they got there, but still, that is something. And he coached in the Midwest and was able to build that offense with the type of players that Wisconsin can get, um, at least in the past. Hopefully, he's going to continue what the staff has been doing now and looking beyond flipping kids from Mac schools to build a Big Ten program because that's not going to work anymore. You know, gone gone are the days where Wisconsin would, would beat Northern Illinois, Vanderbilt, Cincinnati, and Kansas for recruits. Wisconsin has to rise above that or they might as well join the MAC. So, at the end of the day, Gino Gadulli is a coach that Luke Fickle can trust. He has trusted. He hired him at Wisconsin. He wanted him so much that he found a role for him, despite not really having the right fit for him. And he's going to be the pick. I'm okay with the pick. I was okay with the pick when I assumed it was going to be him back in 2023. wasn't excited about it. And I think right now that's the type of coach we need. Someone that we're not going to get excited about. Because if we're not going to get excited about it, we're not going to be as disappointed if it doesn't work. And we're going to be beyond the moon when it does work. So that's what I'm thinking about that. And the last thing that I want to go through, and it's another great question I got here at the end, is if I was a part of the Wisconsin's coaching staff, what would be my message to Braden Locke going forward? I think it's simple. Kid, you've got nothing to lose. I don't think people really realize what Braden Locke was brought in to be, what he's been asked to become, and what that has meant for his future. Braden Locke was brought in to be a backup quarterback. He was bat brought in because of his familiarity with the air raid offense and someone who could be a long-term development project. And if he wasn't going to develop into something, he was going to be a reliable guy in the room to help the guys who were going to develop. And then Tanner Mordecai got hurt. And then... My, 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 TVD got hurt. And... I think he has had to put up a lot of unrealistic expectations over the past two seasons of who he is, what he is, and what he was brought in to do. Um, I'm frustrated that he hasn't grown more because he has shown such flashes of more than conf you know competence like brilliance he has made some throws 
since he's been here that are some of the best throws I've ever seen a Wisconsin quarterback make. And he had that little bit of gunslinger in him that I thought could carry on. But at the end of the day, he has just been too scatterbrain reckless. You know, early in the season, he was too trigger happy. Later in the season, now he's starting to wait too much because he has too much confidence in the guys around him. We need a QB in the middle. So my message to Braden Locke is you've got two or three games left here to solidify your future. Your role for the next two seasons is going to be defined in these next three weeks, most likely two weeks. Um, whether it means he has a chance to be a Wisconsin starting quarterback next year or he transfers to a Sunbelt team and gets another two years in a system that fits him better or he's here as a backup next year. It's his chance. What Luke Fickle has got to do in these next two weeks, though, is he has got to take the training wheels off. He's got to take the training wheels off of the offensive staff and just let them go. Hands off. Let them work. And let Braden Locke work. Because if they don't, then what was the point of even firing Phil Longo? You got to let him try. There's an opportunity these next couple weeks to set the stage for the future for not only Braden Locke, but the whole entire football program. And that's what the staff has to do. And that's what Luke Fickle has got to do. He has got to, you know, if he's the CEO of the, the program, then he has to spin off this department and let his exec executive vice presidents run with it. Because if he doesn't, he is setting the stage for every other offensive coordinator that he's ever going to have. And that's saying, I don't trust you. And that's what we can't have. And that means he's only going to be able to hire a certain amount of people in his coaching career. And that's going to limit him going forward. So, that's it. Sad to see Phil Longo go. I really was excited when he came in. But it was time. It wasn't working. The personal relationship between Phil Longo and Luke Fickle was not working. The system works. The plays work. It's the people who are calling the plays and the people who are administering the plays that have got to do better. And if they don't, then we're going to be seeing some more firings next season. All right, so that's it for today. You know, I had this whole video, this walk and talk planned that I was actually going to be talking about the compar a comparison between Braden Locke and Alex Hornibrook. I even had notes and everything printed out ready to go. Um, obviously, the Phil Longo news changed that. So maybe that's going to come later in the week. I had also planned on doing a breakdown of the Oregon game and slowly starting to get back into the uh, the mix here. Again, now that uh, Phil Longo has been fired, I I don't know if, if, if breaking down the, the lame duck game of the Phil Longo era is there's even a point to it. So... Let me know what you guys' thoughts are about that. Uh, we'll see what's going up. I'll, I'll probably do something about, about that tomorrow going into the end of the week. But we are entering a critical point of Wisconsin football. And it's going to be exciting. 
nerve wracking, whatever you want to call it, and it'll be interesting. So last thing before we wrap it up, the obvious question, and I've had this multiple times here, what's going to happen to the dairy raid now that the air raid is gone from Wisconsin? Am I going to change the name? Am I going to change the focus of my work here? What's going to happen? Well, I'll say this. The air raid offense has been at Wisconsin in bits and pieces for a long time. The plays have been around for a decade. I could go back and do an entire compilation of air raid plays that Wisconsin's run in the past. Um, Wisconsin football is not going to go backwards with the new OC. So that's going to give me plenty of things to break down and to focus on that we're going to keep going. Not going to change the name. Not going to change the focus of the channel because I built a following, kind of, sort of, my niche within the niche under this banner. And even though the true air raid is gone, at least for the short term, um, we're still here. And we're still going to talk about Wisconsin football. We'll still talk about the offense. Talk a little bit about the defense, too. Um, we're still going to be here. So, I'm too lazy. I, I spent all the time in the off season coming up with all the new branding and stuff like that. I don't got time to do any more of that stuff now. So, we're here to stay. Hoping we have more air raid to talk about at Wisconsin. Can be really disappointed if we just come out and, and just run eye information bashing into a brick wall again. But if that happens, we'll break that down too. So that's it for today. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.